Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. This is the France 24 debate. Um, we're talking about uh, the uh, way to defeat the uh, jihadists uh, of uh, the uh, Islamic State Organization, or ISIS, uh, with us to talk about it. Um, she chairs uh, the, uh, how would you say, uh, how would you translate it, the, the, uh, the committee in the French Senate that you chair? It's, it's an inquiry committee um, to fight, to um, uh, settle uh, uh, some proposal against uh, for jihadists. Jihadists and homegrown jihadists. Yes. Which was yeah, also one, one of the topics open that, way, was, yeah. that was discussed by uh, uh, those delegates uh, from 60 nations in Brussels. Nathalie Goudet, welcome back. Yes, welcome, thank you. Welcome back as well to Janine Di Giovanni, uh, Middle East uh, editor for uh, Newsweek, just back from Baghdad. Julien Theron, who teaches at the University of uh, Versailles. And uh, from Cairo, um, Financial Times Middle East uh, correspondent, uh, Borzu Daragahi. Uh, Borzu, uh, you, you penned a, a full-page feature uh, this Wednesday in the Financial Times. Uh, quite a gripping story about an Egyptian who uh, went uh, after the uh, uh, overthrow of Mubarak from being close to the socialists to dying as a member of uh, ISIS. Is that, uh, is that an unusual uh, uh, morph, would you say, for, for disillusioned uh, uh, people who took part uh, in, in the street protests on Tahrir Square? Well, we haven't found uh, many people who have been part of the Tahrir Square uprising or the Bourguiba Avenue uprising in uh, Tunisia who have gone on to join uh, ISIS. Uh, but what we have seen is a lot of young people extremely frustrated uh, by the situation in the Arab world, uh, disillusioned with electoral politics uh, and democratic politics, turning to ISIS, even though they may not 100 percent agree with the extreme ideology. They just want change, and they're in a state of despair. And uh, ISIS, at least so far, has uh, been on a roll in terms of shaking the region. And Borzu, when you see uh, it was one of the uh, items on the agenda for that conference in Brussels, how to put out a counter message, when you think of that, of that young man who, uh, who, who went and died uh, uh, fighting for ISIS. Uh, uh, it seems like a, a, a mammoth task. Uh, I think it's a little bit misguided, too, to think that the root problem is religion or religious teaching. Uh, the root problem is the despair caused by the political, institutional, and economic dysfunction throughout the Arab world. This is what is driving people towards uh, these kinds of militant groups, at least on the part of the people who live in this part of the region. I think it's a little different from the uh, uh, jihadi misfits who uh, come from the West. I think they're in a little bit of a different psychological state. But as far as people who go from Tunisia, Egypt, uh, uh, Iraq even, to join these groups, it's a sense of profound alienation that is rooted more in politics than in faith. Well, from people from the Arab world, um, um, you know, it's also the, the role of humiliation in all these uh, politics. But uh, regarding the French, um, people from Belgium or whatever, from Europe, uh, it's, a, it's a real problem. It's one of the main issues to, to stop them, to prevent them to go. And, and that is really what we are working on. When you hear uh, the, the delegates talk about putting out a counter message, Yes, we it have seems, to. It seems kind of difficult uh, and a bit abstract. No, it's very, it's very concrete, in, in fact, because um, the reality is that those people, especially in Europe, they have a very low level of knowledge of their religion, mm. and sometimes they are not Muslim. You know, we have 24% of people who convert into Islam. Here in France? Yes, mm. which is a big amount of, of people who, who, are, who are Christian and then move and change to fight. So uh, the counter message, it's, it's quite easy. We, we have to bring them uh, some people who can explain them uh, that uh, we try to sell them a wrong message. I don't think it's rooted, um, the Western jihadists, I, don't, I think it's also rooted in, in economics, not in faith. I think it's about being alienated, I think it's being disenfranchised, I think it's being isolated. A young French girl recently left her home and, and went to join the jihadists, and this comes from a sense of not being part of the community, as well as a lack of a future. And the humiliation. We went through the Gaza war this summer. Again. How many young Muslims watch that on television, yeah, but, feeling yeah. utterly defeated and humiliated? And the call to the jihad, 
let's face it, it's quite a romantic notion to them in, in a way like the Spanish Civil War was. Yeah, but and, and I think mean, also it's, it's helpful to think of these jihadis coming from abroad as having perhaps more to do with the Beider Meinhof gang and these other, I think the, the, uh, Janina used the key word a romantic, the Beider Meinhof gang and, and European terrorist groups of the past than to more populist. There was idealism. There was great idealism. Yeah, it's a crusade. It's a kind of crusade. But yeah. to link it with the, the debate of today's, which is on Iran implication, if we see the message from the jihadi is to say that, look, we are Sunnis, we are persecuted by US, Israel, and Iran. So, I mean, they, this is the core message, and we have to work on it. And once again, I'm not absolutely sure that the airstrikes from Iran is a very good solution. Another point is that let's have the full picture of the region, what we were saying. Um, on the region, there's a lot of different groups, non-state uh, uh, armed groups, fighting. One of them, for instance, is Hezbollah. Yeah. And Hezbollah is backed as well as the regime by Iran. And nobody says anything about it, even though they come from Lebanon and they fight into Syria. And, and we don't speak about that much, so we speak about the main Sunni threat, but and rising in there's a well. lot of, of pressure on this side as well, so we should not forget it. No. Nathalie right. Goulet? No, I, I, wa I was thinking about the, the roots of all those fighters coming from abroad, you know. And um, we also have a, a, a bridge with the, with the citizenship, you know. We are, we are talking now about redrawing the citizenship. I was in London yesterday. They also have a very strong anti-terrorist law now passing um, a bill. But those people are burning their passports themselves. You know, there is no uh, link with the, with the citizenship anymore. They, they, they don't feel citizen of everywhere, anywhere else. It's why they are fighting abroad. So it's a big, it's, it's over the Sunnit and the Shia. Yeah. And That's I think interesting. But to this in the region, there's no citizenship. That's the point. They say, well, come here. You're not citizen of your country. You can came, ke come here and belong to our group. And we, are, we are community, we are Ummah. It, it's different yeah, kind of yeah. Nathalie Goulet, to the, point, to the point that uh, the Julien Terron just made, that uh, groups like Hezbollah are being brought in as non-state actors to help out. Yeah, but non-state actors is also because we have a lot of rogue state and gray zone, you know. Th the world is worse than before 9-11. You don't have Syria anymore. You don't have Libya anymore. Of course, you don't have Iraq anymore. And, and Lebanon is as usual. So that creates some space for those... Uh, but and we have to, to structure that. And I'm not we sure have. that the implication of more and more actors, like the fact that to bring some, some people from PDK, so some Peshmerga from Iraq, yeah. to Kobane and to allow Iran Talk to say, like, Turkey. yeah, let's bomb also the Iraq and maybe Syria. Sure. Well, why not? I mean, I'm not sure that it's not participating in, in, in a big regional mess. Uh, we have to structure the region and oof. propose something ISIS. more. Yes, about of it. course. We do not propose anything. When Striking will not resolve this. This is what ISIS wants. Is to this is what ISIS wants, is to create, uh, I think the gentleman is right there, that ISIS wants to create this Manichaean battle between the embattled uh, Sunnis of the region and the other forces, the Americans, uh, the Iranians, the Kurds, uh, the Shia, let's throw in the Israelis as well. Uh, the Sunnis are under threat. Uh, they, they, and this is part of the dysfunction among the Sunni in the region. They have no real leadership. They have no one to look up to. And ISIS fills this vacuum, and it has a message that's very powerful. Uh, so it's a very good point that Hezbollah is getting involved in this, and it's quite dangerous and quite conducive to ISIS's message. So it's ISIS very good to know that Lebanon. But what's interesting is the American military is choosing to talk to the Sunni tribesmen rather than to deal with, with the Shias or to deal, with, to deal directly with Iran. I mean, they would prefer to do what they did in the past and try to talk to the Sunnis and try to see if they can use them as allies against, against ISIS. That's not because but, they don't like Iran. That's because uh, the Sunnis have legitimacy among their co-religionists. And if they say to their sons, don't join ISIS, it has a lot more legitimacy than someone in Brussels or someone in Tehran uh, or someone in Washington saying, don't join ISIS. But on, on another level, one thing that did that I still believe is true is I think the, the overall threat of ISIS is greater than the sectarian divide. Because I do think the Iran-Iraq war, the memory of that where how many million people, uh, one, million. one million people died, 
It's almost as though that doesn't exist. People would prefer to have Iran there fighting with them, fighting against ISIS, than to linger on the memory of that when so many Iraqis died. So I, to me, that was a very telling sign, to look at history and to see, in use Baghdad, that as an example. In Baghdad, that's the view. But if you go to the ISIS heartland in Anbar or in uh, 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 in Aleppo province, you're going to have a very different view of that. But you know, Baghdad is an 80% Shia city at this point, and they have a, a very pro-Iranian outlook. I don't know if you, if you spoke actually to the people People who were Sunni people who were under the rule of uh, Shia brigades like Badr or something. Uh, did you speak to them? I mean, were they happy that the Shia militias? Because we know that there's some I think trouble. They're frightened. They I mean, in June, when, when Borzu and I were in, in Baghdad together, I mean, there was the first traces of the beginning of the Shia militias, mm -hmm. the, the retribution against the Sunnis. And we were going to morgues and seeing people all over again, just like 2006 and just like the Saddam times, people being pulled out of their houses at night, being arrested, being brought uh, somewhere, being tortured, and then disappearing. And this was starting in the summer after the fall of Mosul. So Sunnis are, are frightened and they're terrified of, of the rise of the Shias in, in Baghdad and, and elsewhere, I think. And so I think they still think that it could be a good idea to allow the Iranian bombings? Sorry, there were two questions there. In, in uh, good conscience, I mean, we can't really talk about addressing ISIS without talking about Syria and the yes, uh, ongoing uh, uh, pummeling of uh, Sunni civilians in Syria by the regime there. This is going on and on and on every single day right now and creating recruits for ISIS, feeding into ISIS's narrative. Uh, and now you see the media giving like legitimacy to Bashar al-Assad's uh, interview with Paris Match he had today. I mean, this is ridiculous. This is one of the most mendacious regimes in the region, one of the most murderous regimes in our time. And it, he's getting away with it. He's getting away with it scot-free. This feeds ISIS's narrative. Uh, uh, the money also feeds uh, ISIS. Uh, Borzu, let me ask you about that. In that Paris Match That's interview, Bashar, <laughs> Bashar al-Assad uh, saying that it was fruitless air raids and that what were needed are Syrian government ground troops. Your thoughts on that? I, I think that is absurd at this point. I think Syrian government ground troops are to a large extent a pillar of what got us into this mess. They're opening fire on uh, uh, innocent protesting Syrian civilians in the uh, in 2011 was what gave the it created it, it fertilized the ground for the uh, resurrection of Al Qaeda in Iraq and its extension into Syria and that is what transformed but into this, ISIS. But he's used so, this boys of course so as an opportunity. Him. ISIS has been an enormous opportunity for him. It, it, it's taken him from being the evil Assad who destroyed Aleppo and Homs and rained terror on his people to now being an ally in the fight against, against Daesh, against ISIS. So, I mean, this has been an, a golden opportunity we, for him. We, make, we, we did so many mistakes in Syria. I think we have to be very careful. If somebody has a prescription, we to. Yeah, see, if somebody has a prescription to know exactly what we can do to prevent the people to go, uh, to restore a, a state of law, and then to fight ISIS, please just join us. We we try to find something. Well, it's so yeah, difficult. One, one step for me is, for, for instance, not to back too much one side, like the Iranian uh, Syrian government side. I think it would be a mistake. I completely agree. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, we, we have to be careful. Moderate rebels, and that turned out they? to be a, an enormous mistake. I mean, we saw we that coming. That we much. saw that. We but saw Nusra, the, the rise of the extremism, extremism um, in, in northern Syria. It's and where were the Americans then? Why did they leave ISIS to grow to the point that it has? They didn't crawl out from under a rock. This isn't something that just a genesis of uh, coming from nowhere. This has emerged. And, and I think that, you know, it, the only way we can really address it now is by bringing Iran into the loop. All right, no, no Iran so far, but at that conference at NATO headquarters this Wednesday, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry um, effectively arguing that uh, the broader the coalition, the better. In opposing these terrorists, our diversity is, in fact, a source of remarkable strength because it gives us the credibility and the breadth of reach to move against Daesh, not only in Iraq and Syria, but to counter any support that might exist for it around the world. So, Julien Théron, how diverse uh, is that coalition, really? 
Well, John Kerry said that um, bringing Iran in would be a good idea and it b would bring some stability to the region. I'm really not that sure about it. I think that it, it could really release a way harsher forces around and really I, I, I'm not sure. They did back already the Kurds, so now there's a kind of, there was a kind of committee of the Kurds to, to think of uh, linking the three sides, the Turkish, Syrian, and, and, uh, and Iraqi ones, and, uh, and now it's the Iranians. Well, of course, it's good for the US, it's good for the Iranians, but I'm not sure that it's good for the Sunnis in the region. And that's the root of it. Our friend, the reporter, said that, well, they are afraid of the Shia. We have to give them other opportunities than just like joining ISIS or just being anti-Shia rule. So if you put boots on the ground, and as you say, non-state actors like the Kurds are not the solution in the long run. Well, who's, maybe. Whose boots on the ground? Well, who's bringing the UN ground? in might be a good idea after all those years that we completely deny its authority. But the UN has never been successful in any in the past 20 years, they've failed at every operation they've undertaken. In fact, they've made more a mess of everything that they've gotten involved in. Well, let's say that very few success stories, and we didn't try much so these uh, four years. Nathalie you know, Goudet, who, 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 there's going to have to be ground forces. Who's yes. who's ground forces in the end? Who is going to die for them? Who wants to send people? Who wants to send warrior? You know, so they will need uh, neighbor uh, to go on the ground. And uh, probably for this conference, some missing people are going to be more noisy than people who attend. I mean, the, the subject will be Iran, for sure. All right, and so if you look at neighbors, uh, the Turks don't want to, no. the public opinion in Turkey doesn't want to go to uh, fight. But the Turkish I, I have a terrible behavior there. Terrible. I think the strategy right now uh, is the strategy. There is no other call to build up Iraqi forces. Iraq has the manpower. It has the wealth, it has the experience uh, scattered but as, and disorganized as it may be to take on, to take on ISIS. Uh, and you have right now a prime minister who really appears to be trying. Heydar Abadi has uh, uh, denounced corruption in the armed forces. He has gotten yes. rid of uh, 60 uh, senior officers in the yeah. army and the Ministry of Interior. He has issued a declaration calling on security forces to respect the human rights of people that they uh, arrest. So he's trying. And, and the framework is there, Borzu. I mean, the Iraqi army, they did take off their uniforms and run away when Mosul fell. But I think the morale was so defeated. And I think the framework is generally there. And as you said, Abadi did, or the, the heads of the military, did let go 26 generals. They are trying to reframe it. They do have advisors in from America, from possibly Iran. Um, and I do think they are trying to rebuild themselves so that their own infrastructure but, is much right, it's been, it's just, just, for, just for a bit of context on this, uh, the uh, gains we've seen recently on the battlefield. This week, uh, we've seen big announcements out of Baghdad. The purge of 50,000 so-called ghost soldiers from the payroll of the army, soldiers who uh, either didn't exist or were pay, or paid off their superior officers to stay home. And after years of bitter deadlock, Tuesday's announcement of an oil export deal uh, with Iraqi Kurdistan, a deal hailed by both uh, Baghdad and Erbil as uh, sealing renewed unity in, in, in the face of uh, ISIS. Um, Julien Theron, will this be remembered as the, the week that um, Iraq restored its unity? That would be a very good idea, but I, I think that the, 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 one of the first steps should be uh, to not to bring too much the Shia brigades, militias inside the Iraqi army, or, or to really integrate them, but not to let them autonomous, for instance, because it's still a symbol of a, a little bit like the but, but Lebanese the, army. But is, the Iraqi, army now. but is the Iraqi army ready? Is the Iraqi army up to No, but they, they should just like disper disperse the, 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 the militia, integrate in other corps. It's a little bit the case in Lebanon as well. I mean, uh, f through uh, radical uh, Sunnis, the uh, Lebanese army is seen to work a lot with Hezbollah uh, when they fought against uh, uh, Sheikh Asir. Well, they actually were condemned by, by radical Sunnis not moderate, but the radicals. So uh, I think we should very pay very much attention to that. Another point to fight ISIS, a very good one, I think, is to look to who they sell their oil to. Yeah, of course. Yes. I mean, 
It's the major yes. point of, of, of the income. Yeah. So who buys it? We, have we spoke to about a, a secret deal only. with with the Syrian okay. regime. Maybe it's through Turkey. We don't yeah. really know. But that's that's. Uh, let's it's cut the money. It's you know? fifty thousand barrel a day. Huh? Yeah. That would be maybe a million, way more efficient. A million efficient. a day, uh, basically, yeah. and they're, they're, the the smuggling routes are basically the same ones that were during the time of Saddam. These are decades old and families and the corruption and the backsheesh and the payments are Some exactly the same. Yeah, 20, 20 dollars a barrel. Yeah. You know. And the whole thing about ISIS trading with, with the Damascus regime, it's, I mean, the, the, the borders of the Middle East and the way that it works in the end is money is money. And they're mortal enemies, but they're trading. I mean, we do know that. Borzu Daragahi? Yeah, I think this is a, an issue that needs to be resolved at this point. Uh, I think one of the biggest, you have a huge discrepancy between uh, the price of oil in Iraq uh, and Iran and then up in Turkey. And that's where this oil is, is ending up, primarily because oil, gasoline products are very expensive in Turkey and uh, they're very cheap in Iraq and other parts of the region. Uh, uh, that's really where you need to crack down on this. And so this deal, this the, this Tuesday, that was uh, between Baghdad and the Iraqi Kurdistan authorities, uh, will it help in that respect? Um, I don't know if this will have. It. Yes, it will help actually, uh, because uh, the Iraqi Kurdistan region has been in a situation where they've not been able to uh, provide for their own people. They've not been able to provide fuel and other resources for their own people because of the uh, 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 situation, of the economic situation, the disagreements. And with this agreement, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan no longer needs to, for example, uh, distill its own bootleg petroleum products. It can buy it on the open market using uh, the money that it's getting from the Baghdad government. This will reduce the incentive to uh, uh, trade with uh, uh, illegal brokers and uh, gray market fuel providers. And the resentment and that they haven't been paid in so long. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the resentment to the Baghdad uh, government that they're, where is our money? Why aren't we being paid? So I think that was a hugely important psychological leap for them as well. Yeah, I think from the coalition, the funding uh, problem will be one of the main important because we have to stop it. And from the GCC, from other countries, from smuggling, from every kind of things, and uh, kidnapping. Um, I oh. mean, you know, antiquities, kidnapping. What are the four pillars of how ISIS makes its money? It's oil, it's kidnapping, paying hostage, paying ransom, which our government, the French government. Uh, it's why the British, the British from the law from yesterday, they prohibit the insurance company. Uh, to pay back the money for ransoms. They are not allowed. Brits usually don't pay. Brits and Americans don't pay. It's no, but it, it's included in the law from yesterday in London. Mm. The anti-terrorism. Yes. But there are th three domains we can fight. Well, first, the finance. Uh, second, military. We do not have specific operational goals. I mean, it's a terrorist group. A terrorist group is not, is not an are ideology. They, it's a, a method. state now? It's a method. Are they, st are they, they a very wealthy terrorist group, or are they an emerging embryonic state? No. That, that's the thing about ISIS. That we that have to deny the state. But we need, we need also uh, economic development and political structure. If we spoke about boots on the ground, uh, if we have to bring Iranians in, and maybe Saudi and Turks. Why not? But let's do, let's structure that. Let's have a UN resolution. Let's say, well, the, the Sunni will be protected by, by the Saudis, for instance, and, and all the three main actors of the region hate ISIS, actually. So they would have really much interest to, to bring them down. So it could be a good idea, but it has to be structured. It doesn't have to be like some bombings and to, to close the border, okay. and uh, let's bring some soldiers sometimes, like 200 Kurds from Iraq. So not Th that's a not a good idea. Style yeah, we have, we have to, to maybe like a dissuasion yeah. Arab force. Borzu Daragahi, are, are, are we being yeah. perhaps a little too, uh, a little too pessimistic on that? Uh, are there people behind the scenes who are actually working on a, a more forceful master plan? No, there aren't. Uh, but I would just say that that kind of involvement, I, I think, would be rather uh, precarious. Uh, because it's been my experience that, the, you know, with the uh, first set of car bombs, uh, the UN force or the Saudi force or the Turkey force 
uh, or the Iranian force that is there legitimately would uh, uh, get, you know, experience a backlash back at home and they would be pulled out. Oh, that's absolutely sure. But we have to think about the local governance anyway. What will we do with the borders of these, like you said, non-existing states anymore? I mean, we have, and, and they are afraid on the local ground, like you said. Uh, they are very afraid of their local governance. We have to reorganize that and to have protected forces for them. And I think also we can't forget about Syria. In, in the midst of all of this, actually, you know, there are our goal of defeating ISIS, degrading ISIS, what really has gotten lost in this is the humanitarian situation in Syria. Yes. 1.7 million refugees who are now going to be denied getting food vouchers, winter coming, Homs and Aleppo, an absolute chaos. And the UN, of course, their diplomacy totally Final lame. word from that, Eddie Gurion. Oh, finally, I don't know, but we have to remember who put the chaos in the area, you know, 2003 American people, and we we are very proud to be French and to have uh, Jacques Chirac to prevent us to go to this nightmare. <laughs> that is a fact. All right, Nathalie Goulet, <laughs> we'll leave it there with a bit of French flag waving. Yes. <laughs> uh, For Julia, this case, Julia yes. Théon, Janine Di Giovanni, and Borzu Daragahi, thank you for being with us from Cairo. Uh, your feature piece on that uh, young Egyptian who became a jihadist is in today's Financial Times. Uh, stay with us. There's much more to come here on France 24. Thanks for joining us for the debate.